markets right. tend well, to be. Well, this is also going to come from the expansion potential, right? None of our customers are more than 1% autom automated from an RPA perspective. So that shows you the massive opportunity. But back to the market site, uh, data size, I, Craig and I, uh, and the other analysts we talk often about this, I think the TAM views are very low. Now, you'll look at our market share, let's just get real data out there, right? Our market share in 2017 was 5%. Let's use Craig's linear data for now. You know, our market share this year is over 20%. Our market share applying, and I don't want to give the exact numbers out so we don't provide guidance anymore, is substantially, we're substantially gaining share. Now, I believe that's the reality of the market. I think because we know Blue Prism's numbers, we grow four times faster than them, than them every quarter. Automation Anywhere won't share their numbers, but you know, uh, I can make some guesses, but either way, I, you know, I think uh, we're gaining share on them significantly. I think, you know, Craig's not going to want us to be 50% of the market in two years. <laughs> he's just not, and, and so he's going to have to figure out how to how, how to think more broadly about about that market trend. He talked about it on stage today about how does he calculate the AI impact and the other pieces now, the process mining now that now that we are integrating process mining into RPA, right, a strategic component of that. How does that also evolve the market? So I think you have both the expansion in the product portfolio, which drives it, and then you have the fact that customers are going to add more automations at faster pace and more robots, and that's where the expansion really kicks in. And we often say, you know, look, as a, as a, as a, as a company that, uh, you know, one day will be public company, our ARR number is very important, and we do openly, transparently share that. Uh, but, you know, the other big metric will be, you know, dollar-based net expansion rate that shows really how customers are expanding. And I think that, I know what our number is, we haven't shared it yet, I know all the SaaS companies the top 10, I can tell you, you know, we're higher than all of them. I, the market projections are low, and I think he knows it. Right, I mean, and what you were just saying too is that the, that the company's pitch is that we are freeing people, we are liberating them from the mundane, from the drudgery, from the data entry. And, and as, you, as you pointed out rightfully, a lot of the customers are saying, oh no, it's giving our time, it's giving our employees time back to focus on the higher level tasks, the more creative aspects of their job. But, but I, I wonder if it is, in fact, uh, what, it, what it really is doing to jobs. I mean, I think that there was a really telling line in that Forbes profile of uh, Daniel Dinez, who is the, the CEO of this company, the founder of this company. The newly emitted billionaire. The, the first ever bought billionaire, exactly. Um, where it was an MIT professor quoted saying, you know, we always say to the companies, that we say, give, give us your data and we'll tell you if it is, in fact, uh, having this job killing effect, and he said, the companies don't want to give, give that up. So Accelerate, um, at Accelerate, we're one of the largest niche providers. It's the only thing that we do. We're a process automation and AI company, uh, and our sole focus has been process automation since our inception. In our past lives, we were generalists. Um, we did well and wanted to do it again. Uh, so when we started Accelerate, we wanted to make sure that we focus on a very specific vertical niche, and process automation was just starting up uh, the uptick uh, about mid-2016-ish. I think one of the big trends that's out there, I mean, RPA has come onto the scene. I like how you phrase it, Dave, because you refer to it as, um, uh, rightly so, automation is not new, and so we sort of say the big question out there is, is RPA just flavor of the month? RPA is definitely not, and I come from a firm, we put out a blog earlier this year called RPA is Dead, Long Live Automation, and that's because when we look at RPA, and when we think about, um, when we think about what its impact is in the marketplace, to us, the whole point of automation in any form, regardless of whether it's RPA, whether it be good old old school BPM, um, whatever it may be, its mission is to drive transformation. And so the HFS perspective and what all of our research shows and sort of justifies that um, the goal is, what everyone is striving towards, is to get to that transformation. And so the reason we put out that piece, the RPA is dead, long live integrated automation platforms, is to make the point that if you're not, because what does RPA allow? It affords an opportunity for change to drive transformation. So if you are not actually looking at your processes within your company and taking this opportunity to say, what can I change? What processes are just bad and we've been doing them, I'm not even sure why for so long. Uh, what can we transform? What can we optimize? Uh, what can we invent? If you're not taking that opportunity as an enterprise to truly embrace the change and move towards transformation, that's a missed opportunity. So I always say, RPA, you can kind of couch it as one of many technologies, but what RPA has really done for the marketplace today, it's given business users 
the and business leaders the realization that they can have a role in their own transformation. And that's one of the reasons why it's actually become very important. But a single tool in its own right will never be the holistic answer. That's a very good question. I think it's a question that um, <laughs> has been very common throughout this entire conference. I would say, you know, when I think about scale and what I've noticed over the past few years is that, you know, the actual bot development is about 25% of the work that you need to do. Right, when it comes to scale, there is um, everything outside of the actual development is the important part. So how are you funneling opportunities into a pipeline? How are you um, streamlining the entire process re-engineering of you know, fitting an RPA into an existing process? Um, you know, what is, what are the governance, that, what's the governance you have in place to make sure that the code of that development is clean um, and can be maintained long term? And then more importantly, I think that people overlook, you know, people think of scale as being able to develop a lot of bots. I think more importantly, what scale is, is being able to efficiently maintain a large portfolio of bots. And that's what I've realized this year. We've got now about 300 automations in production and, um, you know, your reputation as an organization is really on how well you maintain those bots. Because if your bots are consistently failing and you're not fixing them quick enough for your functional users to leverage them, um, then you lose a lot of credibility. So I think that's been a big learning for us as we reach scale. How are you guys thinking about the way in which a, a user, a worker, interacts with that, that bot, yeah. that, with that automation? I think it's it's more like a dance and, and less like a, a task manager, right? So you might think in classic automation, you know, click a button, go do this thing. Click a button, go do that thing. The, the, the automation is happening when you want it to. The way that our platform is written, the robot can listen to what you're doing. It can monitor for when you click on a specific button or for when you move files to a folder. So think about it less like a conscious effort to, to guide the robot and more as a, 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 a collaborative uh, you know, effort where, where the robot is seeing what you're doing and, and taking action to help you and, and do things on your behalf and then letting you know when they're done. So it's, the paradigm is changing for work and when you have a robot on your computer, it, it's going to open up a new way of doing your, your daily and, activities. And, and the enabler there is what? Machine learning, uh, machine intelligence? It's a combination of things. So think about machine learning and, and AI as just one tool that that robot has to use. OCR as well. You know, we, we did a demo earlier this week where we took receipts, moved them to a folder, the robot sees that you've moved receipts into a folder, can bounce it off an endpoint that, and, and break apart those receipts using OCR, load that all into Excel and, and help you with your expense report. Mm -hmm. So think about things like this, you, things you need to do, you do what you would normally do, put receipts in a folder, and the robot takes care of the rest. I think the most fascinating thing about RPA right now is that it's really highlighting the problems that organizations have. All their accidents of history are really like being brought up by RPA. And then you've got these digital darlings that they're trying to compete with, the greenfield site kind of people, and some of those don't have beautiful back offices, but let's not go there for a minute. So it, RPA is an opportunity for companies to link their digital dreams with their existing legacy nightmares. I definitely think we're seeing less tech spending expected uh, for Q4, and I think that'll spill into 2020 based on the ETR, and Enterprise Technology Research data that we see. Uh, but, but I think it's actually a healthy pullback. I kind of agree with Guy on that front. And I actually think it is good for RPA. I think RPA is one of those sectors that you see in the ETR surveys that is gaining share relative to other tech spending, and I think that will continue in any downturn. So I expect softness, uh, you know, however you define downturn, I don't think it's going to be falling off the cliff or a disaster, but I definitely think spending will be more tepid. One of the nice things about RPA is you can take your software robots and apply them to an existing process, and a lot of times changing processes, not a lot of times, almost always changing processes is, is painful. However, We've talked to some customers that have said, by applying RPA to our business, it's exposed some really bad processes. Have you experienced that? And 
But can you maybe share that experience with us? Absolutely so. Um, for us, one of the initial um, robots we applied to a customer facing process, it was our field team uh, trying to get back to our customer with, a, with some information. And we realized that the, um, the cycle time was very long and the reason is there are four functions involved in answering the question and seven different applications are being touched, all the way from Excel to ERP to CRM. Um, so what we did, obviously bringing a strategic solution to fix the cycle time and reduce that to streamline the process was going to take us long, so RPA was great help. We reduced the cycle time by putting a robot and we were able to get back to our pre uh, sales team in the field in a matter of minutes. What used to take hours was now being responded in minutes. Now, that doesn't mean that process is perfect, but that's our next step. So we created value for our customer and our sales team who is in the field um, before you know, streamlining and going into a bigger initiative. So. Right. Anything you could share, Christina? Coming from a software engineer background, I, uh, I have, a, at least I had the tendency to don't give enough credit to sales, to marketing, and not, and not to even to the customers, because we, we didn't really understand the customers. And so we, we built technology for the sake of technology. So we were really fortunate to have some early customers, but we didn't understand how. Because I thought that customers should owe to themselves to test and find the best technology out there and just go with it. I, I, I was really kind of, I had a lot of blind spots on how this world operates. But after I've started to visit customers and understand their pain points and their requests, I actually realized they are smarter than us in using our own technology because they use it in the real world. So that message, that, tra that completely transformed my thinking. So I went back to my engineering teams and I, and I tell them, guys, on this day, I don't want to ever hear we don't fix bugs and we do features and we do this. When a customer say you do this, you say thank you. Thank you for showing me the light. I will do this. That's, that makes me create a better product.